citizens are urged to remain in their homes. Those who ignore this warning only expose themselves to danger from the aggressors and from armed citizens who have been instructed to shoot first and ask questions afterwards. Isolated families are in extreme danger. Any escape attempts should be made in heavily armed groups and by motor vehicle if possible. Fire is also an effective weapon. These beings are highly inflammable. Man defense outposts have been established on major arteries leading to all communities. These outposts are equipped to defend all refugees and to offer medical and surgical assistance. Police and vigilante patrols are in the process of combing remote areas in search and destroy missions against the aggressors. These patrols are attempting to evacuate isolated families, but rescue efforts are proceeding slowly due to the sheer enormity of the task. We now bring you Sheriff C.W. McClellan, Chief of the County Police. Well, folks... Things aren't going too badly. We killed 19 of the things today and might have had more. Only my men had to stop to eat and drink. Sheriff, can we defeat these things? Sure we can. All you gotta do is shoot for the brain. Or if you ain't got a gun, just lop their heads off. A machete should do it. Or uh, burn them. Yes, sir, they go up like wax paper if you put a light to them. Only don't let them get too close. So you think you'll have the situation under control? In time. Least ways in our part of the world. Can't speak for anywhere else. <laughs> They're pretty weak, and the only way they can get you is to take you by surprise, or by sheer force of numbers. Only don't wait around waiting for us to rescue you if you're low on food or in any immediate danger. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll try like hell to get to you before they do, but it might take days. So, if you're a large group, strike out on your own. Or hold up somewhere safe and try and get some sort of signal out so we know where you are. <laughs> you might just set some of those critters on fire and send us a smoke signal. Uh, but what exactly are those, uh, critters, Sheriff? Oh, they're deadens. Right enough. Only what brought them back to life, I don't know. Not my concern, either. My job's to put them back in the ground a second time and make certain they stay there. Thank you, Sheriff McClellan. And now, please remain in your homes with all the doors and windows locked and securely fastened. We will be with you every hour on the hour with updated reports on this national emergency. Well, that was a big hip. Don't wait for rescue, but lock all your doors and windows. Stay put and send a signal, but go out if you've got a gun in a car. You might just as well be trying to sort out a screw-up in your checking account. They said they had doctors and medical supplies. If we could somehow get there, they could help Karen. Sure. Carrying a sick child with a crazy lady in tow and the place crawling with those things. I don't think we have much choice. Do you, Ben? The nearest big town is only about ten miles away, and they're bound to have a checkpoint there. Y you from this area? Sure. Judy and I were swimming in the lake over there when those things came. We grabbed our clothes, ran over to the house, found the old lady who runs the farm dead upstairs. Then Harry and his family showed up. You know, I, I didn't even see her. Where is she? Oh, in one of the bedrooms. Pretty chewed up. She had a ten-year-old grandson, but there's no sign of him. Same age as my oldest boy. What? Nothing. Well, that settles it. We go. And I say we stay till the cops come. Mister, I have never wanted to bust anyone in the mouth as bad as I want to bust you. Your kid's sick and you want to stay here. It's murder to go out there. We'll be dead after 50 yards. Yeah, not in my truck, we won't. You got a truck? Jesus Christ, why didn't you say so? Yeah, yeah there's only enough gas to get us up to the main road, and the gas pump out front is locked up. Uh... You gonna volunteer to go out there and bust it open? Well, the key's gotta be somewhere. There, there's a big key ring down in the basement. Well, get it. Are there any uh, jars down there? Jars? Well, s some old fruit jars, I think. Well, get them to get some kerosene. We're gonna make some Molotov cocktails. Toss them out the upstairs window and drive those things back so we can get to the truck and the pump. Harry? You'll be responsible for throwing the cocktails and for covering the front door while we get the truck. As soon as we're out of here, lock it up. Then be ready to open up sharp when we get back. I'll need to take the gun, then. I I've got to have the gun. Heck, hell you do! What you think we're gonna use outside? 
And how do I know you and Tom won't just gas up and go? You don't, prick. That's what makes life so interesting. If we leave, you can just go back down your funk hole like you've been wanting to do all along. Now turn on that goddamn radio, and while we're listening, you can be making the Molotov cocktails. I don't know how to. Well, you fucking learn. Tom, you come over here with those jars. You know how? Sure, we, we learned it in school. <laughs> Some school. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now midnight Eastern Standard Time. The latest report from the Walter Reed Hospital confirms what many of us have thought all along. The army of aggressors, which is attacking much of the east and midwestern sectors of our country, is made up of dead human beings. I don't need him to tell me that. Will you be quiet? Dead people from morgues, hospitals, funeral homes, as well as many of those killed during the conflict, have returned to life with an insatiable desire to kill other humans and to feast upon their flesh. What has caused this terrible occurrence we cannot say, but speculation focuses upon the recent unsuccessful space probe to Venus. You will remember that the spaceship, carrying with it a high level of radiation, crashed into the Atlantic Ocean just off the eastern seaboard. We may never know the reasons for the horror we are now experiencing, but we emphasize that the marauders are not from another planet, but are recently dead human beings. They can be killed easily by a gunshot or by heavy blows to the head. We also warn you, that anyone who dies as a result of being attacked by one of these creatures may also come back to life with the same predatory instincts. The disease is communicable through open wounds, bites, or scratches. Anyone who dies during this emergency must be decapitated or cremated immediately. Harry, where's Helen and Judy? Downstairs with Karen. How'd your kid get sick? She was bitten uh, on the arm uh, by one of those things. You or Helen better stay with her at all times. And you've got to tell Helen what to expect and what we've got to do if she doesn't pull through. You can't do that to her. Well, you heard the radio. If she dies, she won't be the kid you both loved. She'll be a monster. Tom, ask Judy to come up here and keep an eye on Barbara. Harry... You go upstairs and start tossing those Molotov cocktails out the open window, only don't hit the truck. Once you've got a wall of flame going, you come back running downstairs, and as soon as me and Tom hear you, we'll hit the door. Now you hang on to that pitchfork in case uh, some of them try to get through. Then make sure the door is closed and barred again. As soon as you hear us drive up to the house, open the door pronto, you hear me? And get all the women ready to make a run for it, huh? Harry climbed the stairs with a box of Molotov cocktails and opened the window on the landing. As he looked out, he saw groups of the dead things huddled all over, like idlers hanging outside an employment exchange. Some were around the truck. Others were standing in the clumps of trees. Viciously, he began to light the Molotov cocktails and hurl them with all his strength through the window. They burst on the gravel path and the grass beyond, flames illuminating the things as they drew back, moaning softly. Some of the kerosene splashed on them, and their bodies flared like dried Christmas trees. While Harry was busy upstairs, Ben and Tom worked feverishly on the door, prying the wood away from the nails as quietly as possible so as not to alert the things outside. Finally, the last barricade was lifted, and soon after, they heard Harry's running footsteps on the stairs. They darted out, and Harry reached the door, but not in time to stop a panicked Judy who ran after Tom. Harry knew his duty. He slammed the door shut, in time to see Judy's path blocked by two of the ghouls. By now, Tom had clubbed his way to the truck, climbed into the cab, and was trying to start the engine. Alerted by Judy's screams, Ben turned and drove the stock of his rifle butt into their skulls, grabbed the frightened girl, hurled her into the cab, then jumped into the flatbed. The engine fired and the truck rocked across the uneven ground and screeched to a halt against the pump. 
Tom leapt out and fumbled with the lock, but seeing the creatures almost upon him, Ben shoved him back and smashed the lock with his rifle, releasing the gas which spurted in all directions. Picking up the hose, Tom crammed it into the gas tank, spilling a generous sample on the ground while Ben continued to fight off the invaders. Neither of them saw the dying flames from the Molotov cocktails spring into life as they sped across the gas-soaked ground, then leap across the rear fender of the truck. Tom's awareness came from the sudden rush of heat on his back. He yelled, turned and jumped into the cab and gunned the engine, a terrified Judy clinging to him. Ben, knowing that the only escape route was back to the farm, started to run, swinging his gun like a club, head high. Peering through the barricades inside, all that Harry could see was a running man surrounded by misshapen figures and the truck, by now a fiery comet, speeding away into the distance. Suddenly, it exploded in a ball of flame, incinerating its two passengers. Harry! by now wild with terror, abandoned the locked front door and headed for the cellar. Outside, three ghouls were trying to claw their way in, and Ben quickly pulped their heads like a child demolishing toadstools with his foot. Finding the door locked, he retreated several paces, then hopped towards it, using one leg like a battering ram and smashing his way through, just in time to see Harry opening the cellar door. Get over here and help me fix this door! Now, you shithead, next time you pull something like this, I'm gonna throw you outside and feed you to those things. Except that you're too rotten for even them to eat. Helen, come out of the cellar. Tom and Judy are dead. We're stuck here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. For the first time, we are seeing signs that the authorities are beginning to get things under control. Civilian personnel working in conjunction with the National Guard have re-established order in most of the affected communities, and while curfews are still in effect, the intensity of the attack is abating. Law enforcement agencies are predicting a return to normality within the week. However, until then, vigilance must be maintained. We must decapitate and burn all corpses. And now a few words from Dr. Lewis Sanford of the local county health department. Dr. Sanford, can you give us any reasons for this phenomenon? We really can't explain it at present. That's not to say that we won't have an answer for you sometime in the near future, but so far our evidence is uh, inconclusive. But what about the Venus probe? Well, what about it? You know as much as I do, and I'm really not qualified to comment on it one way or the other. As you know, I'm a medical pathologist, not an aerospace engineer. What I and my colleagues have been trying to do is to find a medical or pathological reason for something that is without precedent in history. Most likely the uh, causes are due to a virus or viruses that are unknown to us. They could have mutated or been activated by something like the Venus probe. But will it go on, sir? I mean, will we have to keep burning our corpses? Well, why not? Much uh, the most sanitary way of disposing of the dead should have been mandatory years ago. But again, I don't know. It could be that the diseased organisms that cause the horror are short-lived. Uh, they may die off quickly or be a mutant breed incapable of reproduction. We're hopeful that this will be the case. Uh, but those of you at home listening must decapitate and burn any corpses that might still be lying around. If they are inside the home, just put on some gloves, drag them outside, and put them to the torch. Thank you for those reassuring words, Dr. Sanford. And now, until our next broadcast in one hour, here is some music. Shit! All the lights have gone out. Where's the fuse box? Downstairs. There's a flashlight on the stairs. I've got to get that gun, Helen. We can go to the cellar. You've got to help me. He's already beaten you up. Next time he'll kill you. Haven't you 
done enough damage already. I haven't done any damage. It's him. He's already got two people killed. If only I could get my hands on that gun. Well, fuses are okay. Power lines must be down. I've left the uh, flashlight at the top of the stairs. Helen, why don't you go down and see your daughter? Her breathing sounds kind of strange. Christ, they're trying to get in again. Harry, give me a hand over here. Sure, I'll give you a hand. What are you doing with the gun, man? Help me keep these things out. You keep them out, big guy. Oh, you're not so brave without your gun, are you? I'm going to the cellar, and I'm taking Helen and that zombie girl with me. And you can stay up here, and I hope they get you quick.